I don't like euphemistic language, you know, words that shade the truth. American English is packed with euphemism because Americans have trouble dealing with reality, and in order to shield themselves from it, they use soft language, and somehow it gets worse with every generation. Here's an example. There's a condition in combat that occurs when a soldier is completely stressed out and is on the verge of nervous collapse. In World War I, it was called shell shock. Simple, honest, direct language. Two syllables, shell shock. It almost sounds like the guns themselves. That was more than 80 years ago. Then a generation passed, and in World War II, the same combat condition was called battle fatigue. Four syllables now. Takes a little longer to say. Doesn't seem to hurt as much. Fatigue is a nicer word than shock. Shell shock. Battle fatigue. By the early 1950s, the Korean War had come along, and the very same condition was being called operational exhaustion. The phrase was up to eight syllables now, and any last traces of humanity had been completely squeezed out of it, like something that might happen to your car. Then, barely 15 years later, we got into Vietnam, and thanks to the deceptions surrounding that war, it's no surprise that the very same condition was referred to as post-traumatic stress disorder. Still eight syllables, but we've added a hyphen. And the pain is completely buried under jargon. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I'll bet if they'd have been calling it shell shock, some of those Vietnam veterans might have received the attention they needed. But it didn't happen. And one of the reasons is that soft language the language that takes the life out of life. And somehow, it keeps getting worse. Here are some more examples. At some point in my life, toilet paper became bathroom tissue. Sneakers became running shoes. False teeth became dental appliances. Medicine turned into medication. Information became directory assistance. The dump became the landfill. Motels turned into motor lodges. House trailers into mobile homes used cars into previously owned vehicles, room service became guest room dining, riots became civil disorders, a strike was a job action, a zoo turned into a wildlife park, the jungle became a rainforest, the swamp became a wetlands, glasses became prescription eyewear, garages became parking structures, drug addiction became substance abuse, soap operas turned into daytime dramas, a gambling joint became a gaming resort. A prostitute became a sex worker. Theaters became performing arts centers. Wife beating became domestic violence and constipation became occasional irregularity. When I was a little boy, if I got sick I went to a doctor who sent me to a hospital to be treated by other doctors. Now I go to a family practitioner who belongs to a health maintenance organization which sends me to a wellness center to be treated by health care delivery professionals. Poor people used to live in slums. Now, the economically disadvantaged occupy substandard housing in the inner cities. And a lot of them are broke. They don't have negative cash flow. They're broke. Because many of them were fired. In other words, management wanted to curtail redundancies in the human resources area. And so many workers are no longer viable members of the workforce. Smug, greedy, well-fed white people have invented a language to conceal their sins. It's as simple as that. The CIA doesn't kill anybody. They neutralize people, or they depopulate an area. The government doesn't lie. It engages in disinformation. The Pentagon actually measures nuclear radiation in something called sunshine units. Israeli murderers are called commandos. Arab commandos are called terrorists. The Contra killers were known as freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? And some of this softened language is just silly and embarrassing. On the airlines, they say they're going to pre-board passengers in need of special assistance. Cripples! Simple, honest, direct language. There's no shame attached to the word cripple. No shame. It's a word used in Bible translations. Jesus healed the cripples. It doesn't take six words to describe that condition. But we don't have cripples anymore. Instead, we have the physically challenged. Is that a grotesque enough evasion for you? How about differently abled? 
have actually heard cripples referred to as differently abled. You can't even call them handicapped anymore. They'll say, we're not handicapped, we're handy capable. These poor suckers have been bullshitted by the system into believing that if you change the name of the condition, somehow you'll change the condition. Well, it doesn't work that way. I'm sure you've noticed we have no deaf people in this country, hearing impaired. And no one's blind, partially sighted, or visually impaired. And thank God we no longer have stupid children. Today's kids all have learning disabilities. Or they're minimally exceptional. How would you like to be told that about your child? Actually, it sounds faintly positive. Your son is minimally exceptional. Oh, thank God for that, I guess. Best of all, psychologists now call ugly people those with severe appearance deficits. Things are so bad that any day I expect to hear a rape victim referred to as an unwilling sperm recipient. Of course, it's been obvious for some time that there are no old people in this country anymore. They all died, and what we have now are senior citizens. How's that for a lifeless, typically American 20th century phrase? There's no pulse in a senior citizen. But that's a term I've come to accept. That's what old people are going to be called. But the phrase I will continue to resist is when they describe an old person as being 90 years young. Imagine how sad the fear of aging that is revealed in that phrase, to be unable even to use the word old, to have to use its antonym. And I understand the fear of aging is natural. It's universal, isn't it? No one wants to get old. No one wants to die. But we do. We die. And we don't like that. So we bullshit ourselves. I started bullshitting myself when I reached my 40s. I'd look in the mirror and say, well, I guess I'm getting older. Older sounds better than old, doesn't it? Sounds like it might even last a little longer. Bullshit. I'm getting old, and it's okay. But the baby boomers can't handle that. And remember, the boomers invented most of this soft language. So now they've come up with a new life phase, pre-elderly. They say they're pre-elderly. How sad. How relentlessly sad. But it's all right, folks, because thanks to our fear of death, no one has to die. They can all just pass away or expire like a magazine subscription. If it happens in the hospital, it'll be called a terminal episode. The insurance company will refer to it as negative patient care outcome. And if it's the result of malpractice, they'll say it was a therapeutic misadventure. To be honest, some of this language makes me want to vomit. Well, perhaps vomit is too strong a word. It makes me want to engage in an involuntary personal protein spill.